thank you, Paul. Welcome everyone to the webinar on transforming global health and the role of the global pharmacist. Let me introduce the speakers that are in the house today, uh, starting with Dr. Catherine Dugan, who is the Chief Executive Officer uh, at the International Pharmaceutical Federation. Uh, Professor Paul Lalvani, who has just been speaking, who is the Director of Empower Group Center for Digital Learning uh, in Geneva. Jocelyn Aziz, Director of Pharmaceutical Services, Minister of Health, Accra, Ghana. Professor Steve Howard, who is a, the Clinical Standards Director, a Superintendent Pharmacist in the UK. We already have received apologies from Azuka Okeke, who is the CEO Africa Resource Center, Nigeria. Robert Kindui, who is the Senior Supply Chain Manager, Johnson & Johnson Global Health Public Health Program. Joseph Serutoke, who is the Regional Manager, Middle East and North Africa uh, from the Global Fund. Mr. Daudi Masasi, Director of Pharmaceutical Services, Ministry of Health in Tanzania. Last but not least, Mrs. Neville Okuna Oteba, who is the Commissioner, Health Services, Pharmaceuticals and Natural Medicines uh, from the Ministry of Health in Uganda. In Uganda. My name is Ropa Hove. I am an independent pharmaceutical policy and regulatory specialist from Zimbabwe. Over to you, Paul. Ropa, I think it's still you for the next few slides. Please continue, and the slides are on the screen now. Okay, I'm, I'm waiting for the slide on the screen. It's not, yes, on the webinar objective, the main objective of the webinar is to explore the evolving role of the pharmacist in global health, as well as transforming global health, which was the theme for the World Pharmacist Day this year on the 25th of September, uh, 2020 by the FIP. The webinar will further focus on how the pharmacist's role has evolved. Now going on to the agenda for the meeting, we will have uh, introductions which we have already had. Uh, there will be a little bit more detail on the speakers as well as a number of polls uh, that will be taken as we progress uh, throughout the uh, webinar, just to not to have uh, speaker after speaker, it will break the monotony. Um, the first stage uh, would be now looking at the past, the present, and the future. And the speakers will be Paul and Catherine looking at global health, what it was, how it is evolving, as well as the pharmacy profession, what it was, and how it needs to adapt. The next section will deal with challenges in global health and the need for adapting the role of the pharmacist. We will have uh, Jocelyn, Robert, and Neville uh, articulating the challenges. And then the next session will look at the strategies for intervention where Paul and Catherine will again look at those strategies. Newer and bigger roles of the pharmacist, there will be some examples and suggestions of how to tackle these bigger roles from Daudi, from Joseph, as well as from uh, Steve. Then we go into engagement where there are practical solutions and the way forward. Great. Thank you, Ropa. So First, I'd like to introduce you to a very close friend of mine who I've known for more than 15 years. Uh, we sat on the same committee of uh, procurement and supply chain for malaria elimination many, many years ago. And um, we've been um, uh, in, in touch ever since. So Ropa is a pharmaceutical policy and regulatory expert. 
She is a speaker and trainer who has held leadership positions at national, regional, and international levels in procurement and supply chain and pharmaceutical regulation. She's the immediate past director of pharmaceutical services at the Ministry of Health and Child Care in Zimbabwe. She's of course a pharmacist. This whole session is about pharmacy, pharmacy professions. She has a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and um, one from University of Bradford in the UK and a postgraduate diploma, the most important one from the Empower School of Health. Yeah, um, so first thing, um, we're going to do a poll, um, get everybody engaged, make sure your, um, your computer systems are working and we also get a good sense of who's actually participating. There's uh, five quick, easy questions. It'll take you about one to two minutes. So if you can please answer them and please scroll down. First one is gender, second one is age, third one is your geographical region, academic background, and the years of experience you have. Look at that, 50-50 for the gender. About 50% have already voted. We'll give it another 60 seconds. Oops, 61% going. So it seems about half male, female, the less than 30 and 30 to 40 are the big groups. So all youngsters, at least from my point of view. Uh, lots of people from East and South Africa and Asia and the Pacific and West Africa, that's great. Lots of people with bachelors and masters and equal grouping of five years to more than 15 years of experience. So we have about 70% who voted. I think we can, we can uh, end the poll and just share the results. Okay. So if you can see on your screen about 50-50, 30 to 40 is the biggest group, East and Southern Africa, um, uh, is the largest category, but basically um, we also have some people from the Americas, Europe, um, Middle East and North Africa, a few. Um, it's a target area that we should be increasing. There's a lot of need there. And then most people with pharmacy with an advanced degree. An interesting grouping here, everyone's more or less in the same years of experience. Okay, all done. Thank you. you. Can stop sharing. Let me introduce to you Professor Paul Lavani. He's the founder and director of Empower School of Health. He's a board member of People That Deliver, which is hosted by UNICEF and founder of the Center for Digital Learning in Global Health. He was the former head of procurement and supply chain at the Global Fund. He was the former head of procurement and supply chain at the Global Fund Geneva and has advised WHO, World Bank, UNICEF, Gates Foundation, and several other organizations. Paul will proceed now to present on setting the stage. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ropa. Um, need to edit that profile. There's a duplication there. Team, please note that, okay? So very briefly about Empower School of Health for those who don't know who we are. Um, our focus is about transforming the way people learn, work, and save lives. And we bring digital learning and new methodologies um, 
into the way we approach capacity building. Next. Uh, this is to say that through our um, our various approaches, we've reached actually it's 200,000 learners, 100 plus countries, uh, more than 250 organizations, and over a million hours of training delivered uh, to the target group and participants. Next. What's unique about us is um, us bringing our, uh, the overlap of bringing our learning technology and our team, which is a mix of public health professionals, pharmacists, and including instructional designers, um, digital specialists and technology experts, really all coming together. And it's the, the magic that these groups bring together that makes the difference in, in learning and making things interesting and exciting. And some of our partners, funders and clients are shown on the right side. It includes academia, government, private sector and various others as well. Next. Okay, um, we need to understand, um, uh, again, we'll do another quick poll here to get a deeper understanding about who you are and what you do and which side of pharmacy, which part of pharmacy you're working in. I think it's just, uh, just two questions, okay? We should be all much faster here, shorter questions, and now you've got the experience as well. Fifty percent voted already. Okay, keep going. Nearly there. Once we hit seventy percent, we can end the poll. While we're waiting, it looks like MOH, um, the biggest categories are Ministry of Government and Ministry of Health, Health Supply Chain, there may be some overlap there, Hospital and Clinical Pharmacy is next. Okay. Um, we can end the poll, let's share the results. So Health Supply Chain, Government, big category. Uh, we have hospital and clinical pharmacy as well. Industrial pharmacy is surprisingly, I suppose, um, quite low manufacturing or QA is, is on the low side over here, less than one, just one person. Pharmaceutical sales and marketing, very few as well. Which type of organization, MOH, UN, um, and private sector, good representation. We've got some from academia. And the people who aren't working now, please contact us. We always have projects and um, uh, quick short courses. Many of them are free. Um, we can help guide work with you as well. Please contact our team. Um, we can support. All right, we can stop sharing, go on to the next slide. Thank you for sharing your background. That helps us understand who is present. And then accordingly, our speakers will customize their comments. So the first part of the presentation, I'll speak first and then Catherine will follow and I'll emphasize more the global health side of things with Catherine emphasizing more the pharmaceutical or the pharmacy professional side of things as well and connecting it with global health. Um, so what it was and how it's evolving. Next. I always find this slide quite fascinating. Um, if you can see our life, the human life expectancy 
was pretty much flat in the mid 20, you know, about 20, 25 years old for practically uh, from 10,000 BC and really only started moving up uh, in, the, in the 17, 18, 1900s. And you can see a massive, massive, um, uh, it's not more than a hockey stick uh, curve. It, it's practically vertical and we're in our mid seventies. Um, and we segment this further, next. This is a really fascinating slide. Um, and on the X axis, it's the ex life expectancy of men and the vertical axis, it's life expectancy of women. So the countries, um, so this is, um, it doesn't say it, but it's uh, I think about 2015. So it's pretty much let's say current times. And um, on the lower end uh, we have, um, and it's, it's my color code as well. A lot of uh, African nations are in, in purple on the left, um, the bottom left hand corner and um, the highly developed nations on the top right. So, which is not a surprise. Um, if living conditions are good, there's more, there's better health, more sanitation, et cetera, et cetera, better lifestyles, you live longer. But what's interesting is if you can see carefully, there's a, um, there's a diagonal line and uh, above the diag all the bubbles are above the diagonal line, meaning that women are living longer. Again, not surprising, but as you go further up, um, they live even longer, which means us men are at a significant disadvantage. Um, so whatever we need to get done in our life, we better hurry and get it done. We have fewer years than, than women do. Um, so to say that while average life expectancy is mid seventies for the world, it's very different across the countries. And which means very different um, kind of interventions would be needed in the various countries as well. Thanks. So this slide basically highlights um, the different kinds of pandemics that have uh, been affecting us. Right in the front, um, right in the front are the most recent um, pandemics that we have experienced and way in the back, going back um, several hundred years are, are the previous ones from, from the, the plague, the Black Death to the Spanish flu, et cetera. And, no surprise that we have been experiencing waves and waves of these pandemics um, uh, over the years, with the most recent one of the, uh, being COVID. Next slide. This one tells you the number of deaths the different um, pandemics have caused. Uh, the Black Death, uh, bubonic plague, 75 to 200 million people. And this is in the mid 1300s when the population was, I mean, we're at about 8 billion. I don't know what the number was back then, but let's say it's about half what we are today. Um, you can, that level of uh, those numbers of death decimated some countries. And in some cases, half the population of the countries um, died during uh, the bubonic plague. Smallpox, 56 million. Spanish flu, about 50 million, et cetera, et cetera, and it goes on. And right now, the most current one um, the numbers, this chart was a bit old, so I put the real numbers on the bottom right. 44 million cases for the COVID-19 with 1.2 million deaths and growing, right? So this really tells us, um, then it's been um, infectious disease, communicable diseases are the ones that have been decimating the human population. Next. But if we compare 1900s to 2010, um, the causes of death in the 1900s, as you can see, it's pneumonia, it's TB, it's gastrointestinal disease, diphtheria. Um, and then you have other kinds of diseases, which are non-communicable diseases. Um, and you have cerebral vascular disease, accidents, um, heart disease, etc. cetera. Um, and the bar height tells you the number of deaths per 100,000. So double what we see on the right side, the bar on the right side. And there, if you see almost all the deaths, majority of the deaths are all non-communicable diseases. So mortality from different causes declined by 50% and the cause of death significantly different. Again, a clear indication of 
what we, uh, the way we respond to the various um, uh, diseases and uh, basically mortality and morbidity, we need to adapt as well. And again, these are averages. We need to think about, so this particular example is United States, but, it's, um, but in many cases, we're looking at from a world point of view, these numbers are not, uh, the pattern is, is still the same. Next. So overall, what we can see is cancers, um, uh, the various cancer diseases are increasing and all the other um, uh, non, uh, so the communicable diseases are declining sig significantly, TB, measles, malaria, parasitic disease, and meningitis have gone down significantly and will, sorry, will be going down significantly in the coming, in the coming decade. Next. What's causing, what caused some of these, um, one, the longer lifespan and the ability for us to control, um, control these diseases, part of it is antibiotics. And as you can see the, with the start of um, uh, penicillins in the 1920s, and we have a series of um, new introductions of um, antibiotics between 1920 and 1990s. And unfortunately, we're in a dry spell um, and in a rather dangerous spell where new antibiotics, um, there, there are very few antibiotics with unique uh, mechanisms of action. And at the same time, um, uh, the bugs are developing resistance, significant resistance to uh, the existing antibiotics. So, um, and unfortunately for the multinationals, antibiotics aren't nearly as profitable as um, let's say cardiovascular or chronic disease products. Um, and that's been one of the challenges as well. So that's a whole new area and some of it will be discussed perhaps later on as well. Next. The pharmacy profession and pharmacies, these were the, these, this is what it used to look like. This is about a hundred years ago. Next. The future of pharmacies. Um, they're all shiny with bright lights. They, they have diagnostics. Um, they've got um, self-care and many other, um, uh, many other features which didn't exist before. Next. And within all of this, the idea now as we look forward, health in the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal Era, and Catherine will talk more about this. And of the 17 SDGs, the third one is about, about uh, good health and well being. And there are 13, um, there's multiple targets. Um, 13 targets have to be achieved by 2030. Examples include end HIV, TB, and malaria epidemics, and ensure universal health coverage. Now, to do that, we all need to, given how things are evolving, we need to evolve as well as a, as a pharmacy profession too. Next. That was the last slide from my side and uh, I hand it over to Ropa for the next speaker. Thank you. Let me introduce the next speaker. Dr. Catherine Dugan is the Chief Executive Officer of the International Pharmaceutical Federation. She took up the role in The Hague in June 2018. Catherine is responsible for visionary leadership, support, development, advocacy, and growth across the 150 member organizations and the 4 million members uh, FIP represents. She is responsible for developing and delivery of the strategy, planning, working across global organizations such as WHO and the United Nations and other international professional groups. Catherine chaired the World Professions Health Alliance, which represents 31 million health professionals across medicine, nursing, dentistry, physiotherapy, and pharmacy in 2019. She also signed the FIP or MOU with WHO in May 2019 at the World Health Assembly meeting, which consolidates the collaboration and secures how pharmacy contributes to primary health care and deliver, uh, to, to deliver universal health coverage. Over to you, Catherine, 
to carry on on the setting of the stage. Thank you so much, Rupa, and thank you, Paul, for your um, fabulous introduction and scene setting. Next slide, please. And we can skip on. So I just wanted to tell the audience a little bit about FIP, the International Pharmaceutical Federation. Uh, we are a non-governmental non organization in official relations with the WHO since 1948, but we also work with multiple global partners. Exactly as Paul's uh, mentioned, you, you get much more uh, delivery if you collaborate. Next slide, please. We were founded in 1912 and we're based in The Hague. We have more than 150 member organizations in 104 countries and territories with more than 30 observer organizations and 170 academic institutional members. As Rupert said in my bio, we represent more than 4 million pharmacists, pharmaceutical scientists and pharmaceutical educators. Next click, please. The vision of FIP is that we would live in a world where everyone benefits from access to safe and effective medicines and pharmaceutical care. And our council, the FIP council, which represents all our member organizations, ratified this new vision in September, 2019. Little did we know what was to face us in 2020 as we faced a global pandemic in our world today where this vision has never been truer. Next slide, please. So we attended, uh, you'll, you'll note that I joined the organization in uh, June 2018. We then attended this very week, uh, two years ago, the Astana meeting where the um, political commitment to strengthening primary health care was reinvigorated. Um, this built on the Amata Declaration of um, 19, uh, 1976, I'm sorry, 1978, which was 40 years pre prior to this. And all um, health ministries, governments, and professional organizations uh, signed up to this. We signed up with a particular commitment to this um, from our federation's perspective, because we understand that pharmacists who practice at the hearts of the world's communities make huge contributions to primary care. I'm putting that slide up because I think in the COVID pandemic, we've seen pharmacy really step up, deliver what they normally do, but because pharmacies have remained open in our communities across all our countries and, and societies, the impact of our community pharmacy, access to medicines, access to good advice, access to myth busting has been uh, even more evident than ever before. Next click, please. And for us in the profession, we must align with global priorities. As Paul has mentioned, those include the sustainable development goals to demonstrate to those who are not within the profession, the impact we can make and the contribution we have to FIP, to our, our patients and our publics. And FIP as the global body is here to support that. I hope to be able to uh, provide you with some insights into how we're doing that as the presentations go on today. Next slide, please. We also aligned our work in the last year to the uh, top 10 global challenges and threats that WHO had outlined until the end of 2019. And you'll note that the Astana Declaration really focused on number seven, which was weak primary care. But we all know as of the end of January this year, we've been facing something much more uniting in one way, but much more challenging in another, the global pandemic. Next click, please. So what has happened in our profession, and I hope that this will come out in the presentations as we go through today's session, is the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified all the priority areas we knew were important in our profession and to achieve our vision. And those included drug shortages, uh, the fact that we need a very good supply chains, the fact that we need new vaccines and that we need um, to address vaccine hesitancy in our societies. The fact that patients who are being prescribed many medicines um, are facing a worse outcome if they then contract COVID-19. And the fact that many of our populations are frailer and more elderly than ever before and are more susceptible to the impact of COVID-19. We've also seen issues around uh, antimicrobial stewardship, perhaps taking more of a backseat in emergency care, and the fact that we have um, an awful lot of uh, diversity across our countries in how our populations are managing or not with the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. 
So I will be jumping in a little bit later on as well to talk about strategies, but I hand back to Rupa now. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, the next speaker is Mrs. Jocelyn Aziz. Jocelyn is the Director of Pharmaceutical Services in the Ministry of Health in Ghana. She has over 28 years experience with the Ghana public health sector and has worked in various capacities. She's a pharmacist uh, with a master's in business administration in finance and a procurement specialist. Over to you, Jocelyn. Thank you very much. I shared my slides. I don't know whether I am Sonia. I sent my slide to Sonia. Um, just, just a sec. We just, uh, just slides, we just please. Yeah, just give us a minute. In the meantime, you can, you can start. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity. A warm greetings from Ghana. We in Ghana have um, pharmacy being in various areas. So we have pharmacists in academia, pharmacists in education, pharmacists in industry, pharmacists in research, pharmacists in clinical practice, and indeed pharmacists in our college, colleges trying to teach people to specialize. And of course, we have pharmacists in community practice. Next slide, please. Yes. So this is just what I've sought to. Please let's go to the next, next slide. There are a lot of topical issues. When um, Sonia, present, um, the last presenter, presenter, she mentioned a few issues that need to be considered. And I must say, we have the same issues in Ghana. So there are issues of leadership, medicines management. There are very topical issues that have to do with AMR and rational use of medicines. These are some of the challenges that we are facing. And pharmacists need to rise up to the occasion and find solutions to so there's technology assessment and new product introduction. These are new technologies that um, countries are using to try and leverage on these um, technologies to select medicines that would give us more value for money and improve health outcomes. So we have these as challenges and we are trying to get our way around. We have global health supply chain technical and management challenges. There are key priority public health areas like the former speaker Catherine mentioned, HIV, TB, malaria, mental health issues, maternal and child psychiatric issues. And of course, there are emerging diseases and public health responses like Ebola and the recent um, pandemic that we are all experiencing. Next slide, please. So in regulation, what does it look like? Regulation in two parts. There's um, a body that regulates the product and a body that regulates, regulates the practice. Current issues have brought to the fore the need for us to um, expand our regulatory regimes to cover areas of practice that include that, that include digitization. For instance, in the current um, pandemic, we realized that people were having you know unofficial online services. We have realized that's a challenge, and so we are working very hard to ensure that we come up with regulations that will seek to regulate um, this emerging issue, which is online and pharmacy practice. And so it's the need for us to strengthen and implement our existing legal framework to the entire city anyway. So the issues that come to the fore, is, for instance, one, how can online tools be deployed in pharmacy practice to address the issues of enumerated? We are thinking about telepharmacy and how we can use technology to remotely to reach people who are quite remote from the structures that actually produce the service. Next slide, please. Like I said, we have pharmacists practicing academia and research. Global trends point to the fact that there's a need for us to update our curriculum so that the pharmacists that we turn out from these um, institutions, our investors, will be able to be um, well vexed and ready to face issues of challenge, um, emerging um, challenges. Key among this, for instance, is the antimicrobial resistance, patient safety, health technology assessment. All of these are now being factored into our curriculum. For instance, in the past, we had what we call the bee farm. We realized that we need a, a higher cadre of pharmacies that can respond better to clinical issues. Right now, worldwide, pharmacy is moving away from product um, centers to 
um, improved health outcomes and more patient safety. So we have now what we call the farm D. We scraped the beef farm and we are moving on to farm D. We really had, um, had to circumvent or change the curriculum so that people who are the beef farm have the opportunity to top up and do a bit more clinical work and become clinical pharmacists in farm D. So these are some of the things that academia is, the challenges that we've um, realized with academia and some of the solutions that we are preferring to solve them. How about, we realize that there's a strong need for collaboration between researchers, our college of colleges, and then academia. So as I speak with you, there are lots of collaborations ongoing. One of them is, for instance, the collaboration between the Commonwealth um, Association of Pharmacists, our college of pharmacists, and our academic institutions to help um, our students to generate data that will support the work that we are doing. Next slide. Community practice. In the past, as we all know, um, people in community practice were just product-centered. And the whole idea was for them to you know, give you the product and say, take it one, three times a day. No, we've realized that there's a need for us to bring about change in our community practice that will respond to the emerging trends. All the key things that we are doing in Ghana is that we are assisting the practice pharmacists to kind of have POS systems that will capture data and that would also be able to, apart from just you know, giving out drugs and patient counseling, patient information, be able to take their um, fasting blood sugar, be able to take their blood pressures, monitor them, keep their data so that we and there's a need, you know, the pharmacists live in the community with them. If there's a need for a pharmacist to refer a client who lives within the community to a higher institution for management, for instance, for diabetes or for hypertension, this person already has data, the patient and can on um, the referral available to the next level of care, available data. We are working to strengthen the patient's care at the community practice level. We are thinking about innovative ways of uh, medication interventions. For instance, we um, you know that a lot of drug abuse. So um, pharmacists at community levels are encouraging people to even bring to the pharmacies what kind of medication they've taken before they bring um, a, a common condition to them to treat. We are also encouraging and we are training our community pharmacists and rational use of medicine so that they in turn will be able to impact this to their clients. Issues of AMR, like I said, are very topical. We are including our community practice pharmacists so that they interact and deliver their duties as pharmacists. We're weary of very efficient and um, good use of uh, anti-malarials. We all know the menace of um, anti antimicrobial resistance and what a threat it, it poses to our profession. So these are some of the interventions at the community practice level. Next slide, please. In the area of clinical practice, um, there's a massive change, I mean, globally, and we in Ghana are trying to align. More of um, the pharmacies that were in the hospital are being uh, trained, trained service and pre-service to be able to be more clinically oriented such that they'll be able to receive patients dispense to with the right information, work as a team with um, health, health teams within the facilities where they operate. In the past, traditionally, pharmacists would just be reserved to their dispensing um, areas where they just um, dispense. Now we have pharmacists who have been trained and are actually a part of the team. They offer patients medication information. They are able to prevent um, Drug drug interactions, such that they're able to reduce the ad of, um, adverse reactions and stuff like that. So, we have identified all these problems and we've come up with um, solutions aimed at improving the upon the education of farmers so that they can fit better in, in, as part of the health team. In the past, it was unheard of to have a pharmacist in Ghana joining the clinical teams. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to announce that this is now a thing of the past. We have clinical teams who are pharmacists who are relied upon for very valuable information. And this is all in response to the emerging changes in the global trend for pharmacists to be out there to help 
to improve health outcomes. We have who are used as catalysts as antimicrobial stewardship programs in health facilities where they operate. Next slide, please. Trade and industry related issues. We also have pharmacy. You know, Ghana is um, next to West Africa, one of the countries that has quite a vi relatively vibrant um, manufacturing industry. And COVID 19 has brought to the fore the need for us to strengthen uh, local manufacturing industry. Already there are a lot of initiatives ongoing. We realize that they need tax exemptions. We are working on that. We have even come up with innovations such as what we call the restrictive medicines list. We have certain medicines that have been identified, have been submitted to parliament, and we have approval to place a restriction on, that, on these medicines, such that these medicines will only be supplied by the local manufacturers. This is a way of strengthening them. Even with our procurement systems, we have what we call a 50% to 20% preference, which we apply in all our ministry of health centers for medicines that are locally manufactured. So these are some of the things that we are doing in Ghana to strengthen our local industry. And a typical call is um, when we had this pandemic, we realized that um, PPEs were not available, very difficult to come by, hand sanitizers, where they come by. What did we do? We quickly went with our Ghana Food and Drugs Authority and then we supported our local manufacturers to come up with very good quality hand sanitizers at affordable prices. So, pandemic started in February, by March, April, we had a whole lot of hand sanitizers readily available at very affordable prices. This happened because we had collaboration between our Ministry of Trade, our regulatory authority, the ministry itself, and our local manufacturers. So, it is important that countries strengthen their own local industry so that when it's time, for the industry to support them, they will not be found wanting. We have even embedded in our med medicines, Ghana national medicines policies, several initiatives to help strengthen our local manufacturers. One of the key ones is that the government policies, which are being implemented right now, to help this, uh, financially assist the local manufacturers to be able to upgrade their structures such that they're comparable pertains in other jurisdictions and we'll talk about good management practices. A few of them even said working towards having WHO pre-qualification. So we have identified the weaknesses and we are working towards strengthening our local manufacturing industry because COVID-19 has taught us that it's better that you strengthen your own and then you rely on it when the need arises. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, we also, we've also um, identified the need for us to leverage on ongoing technologies, tools, if you like, that are being used elsewhere. So for instance, one key thing we are doing is using HTA in our pricing mechanisms as well as, as well as in our selection of our products. It's something that we just started. We have um, partnerships with NIPH, Norwegian Institute of Public Health, and ADP Path. And what we've done is that we've institutionalized HTA as I speak. So we have the governance structures. We have done some um, um, process guidelines. We have an HTA strategy, which we are facing and will learn soon. The idea is that looking at the emerging trends and thinking about innovative ways of realigning ourselves within the pharmacy landscape, such that we'll also be able to leverage on such technologies to have affordable, good quality medicines that would give us value for money. Yes. Next slide, please. We also have pharmacists in the supply chain. I mean, policy. we have several policies that stick to bring about specialization. <coughs> Sorry. So we have a whole supply chain. I mean, COVID-19, it's not like we didn't know before, but COVID-19 brought to the fore the need for us to strengthen our systems, particularly our supply chain. <coughs> so as I speak, we have a college of pharmacists that is offering several courses, including supply chain, um, public health, clinical pharmacy, drug manufacturing, and what have you. The whole idea is that we want to create our own local expertise that can rise to the occasion and strengthen our local manufacturing industry. Yeah. These are some of the challenges that we realize in the 
tailor-made solutions that we are applying to ensure that the challenges are addressed. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, we also realize that in the international landscape or global landscape, there are diseases of public health interest. Most of these diseases for us in West Africa have, have lived with us for a long time. HIV, TB, malaria, and what are non-communicable diseases. So we as pharmacists are working closely with programs. You realize that for each of our national uh, control programs, TB, malaria, we have pharmacists who are key actors in medicines <laughs> and are providing specialist um, <clears throat> inputs to ensure that these programs are run properly. So we realize that pharmacists are cross board and we are thinking about new areas like, for instance, as I speak, we have um, an association of oncology pharmacists. We are thinking about types of socialization. We are I'm working in my office with other stakeholders to try even come up with pharmacists who would specialize in psychiatry because we realize that issues of mental health are quite a challenging and are quite neglected, if you like. So these are some of the challenges that we realized and the solutions that we are preferring to address the challenges. Next slide, please. Yes. So I would like to end by saying that pharmacists must be strengthened to perform all of these functions within our systems to ensure that in view of the global trends, we are also not left behind. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn, for the comprehensive challenges and needs and some solutions from the Minister of Health. Our next speaker on the same subject of challenges and needs is Robert. If I can introduce Robert, Robert Kimbui is the Senior Supply Chain Manager for the Sub-Saharan Africa at Johnson & Johnson in their Global Public Health Program. He's a member of the GPH Supply Chain Leadership Team and supports the implementation of GPH supply chain strategies across Sub-Saharan Africa. He's a licensed Kenyan pharmacist and supply chain professional. Prior to Johnson & Johnson, Robert was the supply chain director uh, uh, and chief pharmacist for Good Life Pharmacy Limited, the largest retail pharmacy chain in East Africa. He, was, he has supported the implementation of public health supply chain processes in his prior roles in management sciences for health, uh, MSF and Labore Kenya Limited. Over to you, Robert, on the challenges and needs from a private sector perspective. Uh, thank you, Rupa. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to take you through a brief overview of uh, Johnson Johnson Global Public Health Program. Um, uh, we are the public health division of Johnson & Johnson, one of the largest um, healthcare companies in the world. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, at Johnson & Johnson, we're an innovation company. And um, our key focus is to focus on the most vulnerable. And this is at the heart of everything that we do. Uh, our team is big with over 130 people across 26 countries. And we leverage on, on, on partnerships and ensure most of our partners are also on this call. And we have over 100 plus partners that uh, help us to deliver impact. And up to date, since the um, launch of the Global Public Health Program, We've been, we've been able to impact 130 million plus lives uh, currently. Next slide, please. Our main mission is to ensure that our innovation uh, products are able to, to become more available, affordable and accessible to the world's most vulnerable and undeserved populations. Next slide, please. And through this, we're targeting um, five main um, disease areas, uh, which, is for, which is highlighted in mostly developing countries. Uh, and this is tuberculosis, HIV, mental health, vaccines, and, and um, intestinal wounds. Next slide, please. So, and uh, currently today, 
under the HIV uh, portfolio, we're, we're able to support various countries in Africa and the world in, with support for third line HIV medication. Uh, in TB program, we were, were, the, were the main provider of, um, of multi-drug resistance TB medication, which is known as Saturo Bedapale. Uh, where we also have mental health programs that were supporting patients with schizophrenia with our products of uh, Risperdal and Invega Trinza. And we're also part of the main uh, STH uh, donation program through our VAMOX uh, program, which is in collaboration with other, with other multinational companies. Uh, going forward, we're also part of the panel of manufacturers who are in the process of researching for a COVID vaccine. And hopefully we should be able to have a, a positive result uh, to, to, to enable the world get over this current pandemic. We're also working on, on new uh, HIV treatment regimens, as well as Ebola and, and HIV vaccines and other uh, infectious diseases uh, such as dengue and, and Zika. Next slide, please. So to support our programs, uh, mainly in Africa and across the world, we, uh, before we, we started looking at initiatives that we were willing to support, we had, um, we had to do like a baseline uh, review of, of this emerging market. And these challenges that are identified are not unique. I, I need to say they're not just unique to emerging markets, but they're, but they're also similar in developing markets as well. What I must say is that they, they are more pronounced in the emerging markets that we work with. And so we looked at it in 11 lenses, uh, basically formed from the way j, j globally looks at, at its own supply chain process. And the main one of this, based out of these 11 lenses, we then focused on four main challenge areas, which we're going to, to look for partnerships and have programs that are implemented uh, to support the various programs and, and support governments. Uh, Ghana is actually one of our key partners in Nigeria and, uh, and, and other countries within Africa. So, and, and this is not limited to this right now because um, with, with each year, as we, as we keep on increasing our partnership, we'll be able to leverage on the length and breadth of JNJ to be able to mitigate a lot of these challenges. So that said, which were the challenges that we mainly found? Number one, and this is and this is actually um, uh, not restricted to the public sector. This also was um, also took into consideration the private sector in the markets that we visited. So one key gap that we found was in the planning processes, and uh, Jocelyn has actually alluded to this and a lot of the other presentations. This was in inventory management. So we're finding the inventory management was a bit poor, and there are very many reasons why inventory management is poor, and the bulk of it was uh, data usage, access to data to be able to make accurate supply chain uh, inferences. Uh, without without data, honestly, to, to get accurate supply chain information is is pretty difficult, and that's why you'd notice either either we have uh, stockouts or we have too much stock in a lot of of, of the public and also private sector uh, facilities, and this also impacted their forecasting processes, and and that is why one one of our key opportunity area identified was to support governments and and our various partners in improving the planning processes so that they can meet, they can improve their forecasting and demand planning processes. The other thing we looked at uh, was cost drivers. Uh, what we across Africa, the intermediaries really increased the price of costs, and this and cost was a big um, a barrier to access of medications in in various markets that we visited. Uh, this is a very uh, very thorny issue that can be addressed, but it has to start from somewhere. And we are in discussions with various people to see how we can support to 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 be able to bring. Um, uh, costing of medications down and improve access to medicines. But what we've done, especially in the programs that we that that we support, we are able to provide these products, uh, especially the third line HIV medications. Uh, we provide them in, in very 
and for example, the New Horizons Collaborative that we work with various partners across Africa to provide uh, third line HIV medications to pediatrics and adolescents. And these are provided for free. But going forward, we're trying to look for a more sustainable way that this can be implemented. Uh, the third lens was manufacturing strategy. Manufacturing is, is uh, Africa essentially is a huge market, uh, emerging market for the manufacturing sector. And we're also trying to see which initiatives we can be able to support to improve uh, better manufacturing pra uh, practices. Supply chain structure, this also alluded to, this also brings uh, similar challenges with cost drivers. So what are the various intermediaries in, very, in the various levels of the supply chain? Uh, what partnerships are there to ensure that the products are are shipped from, from the point of manufacture all around the world to, to the patient all the way to the last mile in, in the various villages uh, that, that we have across Africa. Uh, the other big gap that we honestly, that we really found was cold chain capacity. And cold chain has actually become to the forefront now due to, due to the need to have increased access to vaccines because most vaccines require to be stored um, at a temperature of between two to eight, and and Africa being very a very in general a very hot uh, uh, to have a hot environment, cold chain capacity really needs to be enhanced to ensure that the quality of these products are are maintained uh, all the way to the last mile. And and that said, cold chain is one of the aspects that that we are also focusing on uh, uh, as GPH. And, and we'll have various initiatives that are going to come up after this. Uh, the fifth lens was infrastructure, transportation, um, partners in, in transportation, warehousing of medicines. Uh, what you found is uh, a lot of the warehouses now um, are, are lacking. And this is especially in, 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 in the last mile facilities. In big cities, you find that there are enough warehousing and storage capacity uh, spaces that are currently there. But in, but in more remote areas, this is, is, is a challenge. Drug diversion was also a big issue. Uh, across the supply chain process. And, and this is how we, we also need to partner with various regulatory bodies and governments to be able to see how we can close these loopholes. Uh, patient satisfaction was also a big, was also a big issue. How, how are the patients accessing care? How, uh, and this is a core role also of the pharmacist, the advice that the patients is getting, how, how are they using this, this medicines um, going forward? Are they uh, pharmacovigilance activities? How are this, uh, how are all this being monitored as we, as, as we, as we go through the, the whole process of the supply chain? Um, yeah, so uh, the, the, the other aspects of, um, of uh, counterfeits and uh, and up to the level of environmental factors, data management were all uh, key gaps and challenges that we noticed uh, across the Africa landscape. But the good thing with this is uh, a good thing about having challenges is there are also a lot of opportunities uh, in this space as well. And I do believe as pharmacists, we are, uh, we are the owners of, 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 of this pharmacist and we're, we're up to the challenge to meet um, to, to, to meet these challenges across the continent. So maybe just a quick highlight of the initiatives that we currently brought up. Uh, next slide, please, final slide. So as I said, we were, at least within this period, we're focusing on four key areas. And with that, uh, uh, to, to, to be able to impact the public health uh, system, we, we, we were able to participate in various boards we, we want to introduce CEO roundtables of the various procurement bodies. That way they can be able to share uh, their various experiences because there, there are a lot of strengths from each separate uh, procurement entity. Kenya can learn from Ethiopia, Ethiopia can learn from Nigeria. What we found is the, the, there wasn't a platform where this knowledge, uh, where this knowledge sharing uh, can actually happen. Uh, we are participating in the Gavi Step program. Gavi is one of our, of our program to help uh, support again supply chain initiatives and and cold chain management. And currently, we are doing a Sub-Saharan Africa cold chain capacity mapping, and we'll be able to share these results once this is completed, uh, hopefully by the end of this year. And the key focus countries will be Kenya, Botswana, and South Africa, where we're looking at the capacity 
uh, the capacity gaps in coaching. The essence of this, of doing this in these three countries is that we're, we're going to provide a benchmark of how other partners can be able to support these initiatives in other African countries and be able to have a gap analysis of their various coaching capacity with, with the need to bring in uh, the COVID vaccine, other vaccines, let's say the HIV vaccine, other coaching uh, man managed products like insulins, um, we really need to understand what's the capacity gap from all the way from the main uh, supplier to the last mile. And it's a huge uh, task, but it is possible. And there are various partners who are going to come in and also be able to support all these initiatives with the governments, obviously, of these various countries being at the forefront of, of the initiatives that we have. Yeah, and that's my presentation. Uh, thank you, Robert. The, we, we are not doing well for time. So if I can seek the indulgence of the speakers to summarize, I know there is a lot of issues and um, the speakers are quite passionate or, uh, for, for the area, but I'm just really seeking your indulgence to keep to uh, maximum three minutes. Let me introduce the next speaker, Ms. Neville Okuna Oteba. Mm -hmm. Neville is the Commissioner of Health Services, Pharmaceuticals and Natural Medicines in the Ministry of Health, Uganda. She's a pharmacist and has completed her MSc Pharmacy at Havana University in Cuba, MSc Pharmaceutical Services and Medicines Control from Bradford University, UK, MBA from the Eastern and Southern African Management Institute in Tanzania and uh, postgraduate uh, diploma in project planning and management from the Uganda Management Institute. Uh, over to you, Neville, just briefly on the challenges and needs. Thank you, thank you, Rupa. Thank you, everyone. Warm greetings from the Pearl of Africa, Uganda. Hello, everyone. I sent my slides to Sonoya. here. Can you share or I share what I have? You can share what you have, uh, Neville, while they, they are sharing what you have already sent so that we, are, we do not miss on time. Okay, without wasting much time, uh, the highlights from pharmacy practices in Uganda is such that um, is governed by Acts of Parliament, namely the National Drug Authority and the Pharmacy and Drugs Act. And then the practice settings include consultancy, community pharmacy, hospital, and medicine supplies regulations, veterinary pharmacy practice, industrial pharmacy practice, importers or distributorship. We also have an uh, element of TCM, academia, policy, and warehousing and supply chain. Uh, we have both pu public and private pharmacy practice settings in Uganda, just like any other third world country or un uh, developing countries. We have a few pharmacies and most of the practice units are actually concentrated in the urban center. Can I be able to share? Okay. As we wait for the screen to come on. Okay. Uh, task shifting is the order of the day in pharmaceutical services uh, in Uganda. And our practice is basically product centered and supply chain focused. We have uh, limited, limited skills in pharmaceutical manufacturing and basically the changing roles of pharmacy, which I take as opportunities include pharmacies have been recruited and have big roles in managing programmatic supplies, for example, Global Fund. Uh, we have pharmacists in charge of HIV, another one in charge of malaria TB, and other programs that naturally or earlier on didn't appreciate the role of pharmacists. We also have pharmacists employed by other development partners like UNICEF, CHAI, 
uh, WHO, you said different and to mention, but a few. Pharmacists were, and I say, remain central in the management of supplies for public health emergencies, namely Ebola, SARS, cholera, and right now, COVID-19. I must say that our pharmacists work very hard hand in hand with other uh, response team and the pharmacists who are managing the, the pillars, the COVID-19 uh, logistics pillar. And it is important to note that the pharmacies constituted 50% of the COVID-19 logistics pillar membership out of about uh, 40 members. And in, in this area, they were basically handling supply chain planning, forecasting, coordination of procurement, pipeline monitoring, commodity gap analysis, coordinating deliveries of procured and donated supplies, order processing, supplies audit accountability, and ensuring transactions are recorded as and when they come. We were also involved in, in planning for redistribution where some of the items are overstocked to avoid expiries. Sufficient to note that the, the pharmacists in Uganda were able to participate in the development of countermeasures. These are policies and guidelines that are govern how the response should be, should be handled. Any public health emergency, be it cholera, be it uh, meningitis. So we have a policy that spells out the role of the logistics team and other pillar members. We also uh, instituted uh, an inform a logistic information management system called the name EELMIS to help in the response. And in this case, we were receiving, we were able to connect doing virtual orders and, money and processing these orders virtually. And in real time, you can view uh, the, sub the supplies from every store, be it the stores of partners or public or private. That one helped us a lot to coordinate which store has got which supplies that were being given out. Then also, we were key in receiving and analyzing emergency supply needs Papilla and also other development partners and stakeholders who are interested in knowing the supply gaps and coming in. And this helped quite a lot uh, in, in, in generating response in terms of donations. We also had challenges. First of all, we have gap in training of pharmacies. We find that the pharmacists are ill prepared to handle public health emergency situations and the continuous professional development that would help us to fill some of those gaps uh, seem to be a little bit expensive. Recently, the, the PSU instituted the um, online CPD, but I think we are not able to continue with it uh, due to the finances involved. Inadequate number of pharmacies is something which is challenging us. Much as we have sensitized the partners, they now value the contribution of pharmacies. The pharmacies are not readily available to take on the various emergency logistical response activities that requires technical input from pharmacists. Of course, we have still have challenges of inadequate finances and therefore, they identify the gaps, or even if the pharmacists do the supply chain analysis, gap analysis, and then you find that the finances are not coming forth to fill the gaps, then people get uh, demotivated. We also have lack of knowledge about the role of pharmacists. Most of our stakeholders, our partners, or the public do not appreciate the role of pharmacists as part of the healthcare givers. They understand the role of doctors and nurses, but that of pharmacies, we need to do a lot to make sure that they can uh, differentiate our roles properly. Another challenge is getting all the partners to immediately buy in and to be coordinated. You no, know, during emergency response, there are so many partners who want to help, 
and coordination becomes a problem. You find some of the, the information is, is being looked over and then uh, you find it, it's not very easy to get everyone to have the same vision and to do the right thing. Financial commodity and HR gaps, that one I've already highlighted, is very high and it undermines our effort to contribute effectively into the global health. We also realize that in this era of technology, we have gaps in the sanctions that would enable digital health penetration, for example, data, hardware, availability, computers, or airtime is a problem. And also the usability of data generated is still very low. And we have a challenge with behavior change. Uh, for example, the use of virtual orders. Some of our colleagues are not yet well, 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 well versed with the, the electronic orders and therefore continuous uh, professional education in that line is very, very important. Capacity gaps at the warehouses, uh, for example, during the COVID-19, it reached a point whereby the orders were too many and was putting a, a very big burden on the warehouses. And, and therefore, we need to build capacity of the warehouses uh, to manage emergency at their peak. Uh, now, this brings me lastly to the paradigm shift, what we need to see and maybe the recommendations. I think that it will be very, very important to enhance use of health tech e technologies for emergency management and response or during public a health emergency. In Uganda, we adopted the use of emergency electronic logistic management system, which is doing quite well. However, it requires that the stocks are available all the time. Then also, I feel that the training institutions should adequately prepare the pharmacy students to take on non-traditional pharmacy roles and responsibilities. And also they should be, they should be assisted uh, to get a stint in the public health emergency management so that they are not uh, overwhelmed when they come out here. We also recommend that uh, we re-emphasize pharmaceutical care because like during this emergency response, the patients, each patient has got a unique, a unique response to the, to the disease state and therefore if possible pharmacists are supposed to be at their bedside uh, to do the individual uh, pharmaceutical patient care which is very very key and very important for maximizing positive treatment outcomes. We also want to emphasize on pharmacovigilance of commodities recommended for use during these uh, uh, public health response because we need to document how the patients are responding and also how the medicines are behaving, whether we are getting value for money or not. For example, right now for COVID, we have uh, a lot of uncertainty about the use of the hydroxychloroquine and therefore we need to, uh, we need to manage the patients who are put on hydroxychloroquine and any other. Governments or professional bodies are to prioritize CPD to enhance the skills of pharmacists to offer pharmaceutical care and also to, to actively participate in the management, the clinical management uh, during emergency response. There's also need to orient pharmacists on the use and the principle of med medical countermeasures. And those are the principles that guide how emergency response is supposed to be done what pillar is supposed to do what, how many committees should be set up, how are the orders supposed to be made, how are the orders supposed to be processed and accounted for. I thank you very much for listening. Bye, back to you. Thank you, Neville. That brings us to the end of uh, part one. Can we proceed now to part two, strategies for intervention by Paul? And Catherine. Thank you very much. Um, 
let's quickly go to the next slide and um, just wanted to connect. Um, thank you for laying out the challenges. The speakers, uh, there were several common themes that, that I picked up. We heard about antimicrobial resistance, new technologies. Um, uh, we heard about collaboration, the need for collaboration and data. Data, data, data was a big challenge. Um, online tools and digitization was another big, uh, big challenge. Uh, leadership and uh, leadership, uh, lead management and leadership. So soft skills was also um, and training uh, and mechanisms of continuous training, not just uh, on specific topics, but even beyond as well. Could I, uh, Neville? Could I just ask you to mute your microphone? Um, there's some disturbance coming through. So. Um, Let's, let's see how we take these, um, these various challenges that have been highlighted, um, and we'll talk about potential strategies for intervention, then the speakers. Uh, we have three other speakers that will talk about potential solutions and experiences they have with solutions as well. Um, and I really request, we are way, way behind time, I request everyone to keep their comments to five minutes or less as we go forward. Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about strategies for intervention, we need to know and understand where can we intervene, in which areas and how. And one of the really valuable, useful slides is the WHO's, um, the, the six pillars or six building blocks of health systems, uh, which is highlighted in green here, service delivery, health workforce, health information systems, access to essential medicines, financing and leadership and governance. And so if we're going to find mechanisms of intervention, we would need to work through them and with them. Patient engagement, so this is an adapted chart that someone at HSG had developed, which is really useful. Communication is another area. And all of this is supposed to lead to access, coverage, quality, and safety, with the overall outcome of improved health, responsiveness, uh, financial risk protection, and improved efficiency. But it's not, next slide please, but it's not just the health system where we can impact. There are um, allied systems as well, which impact health as well. Sanitation, uh, water and sanitation is another big, big area. Uh, and better education, better nutrition, all of these are potential areas that can support and strengthen uh, the health response and health and safety. Next. And as we, as we move forward, um, you know, the various solutions and innovations that are in the pipeline, we heard about new product introduction as one of the challenges that, that Jocelyn mentioned as well. We are nine years away from what many um, technology experts, medical experts have identified as what's in the pipeline. Um, AI um, will free doctors from their keyboards and will support them in terms of diagnosis. It will help patients diagnose their own medical problem. Wearable monitors will give patients medical advice. Um, we will replace humans for image interpretation. Technology will do that. There will be um, genetically altered individuals and um, unborn children will be able to be genetically modified as appropriate as well. So lots of changes are on their way. Some will come sooner rather than later, depending on the country we're in. And the question is, how do we, as pharmacists, really um, uh, prepare ourselves in an environment that's going to be very tech heavy? And this is not very far away. As I mentioned, it's about nine years away. Next. So with that, I pass it on to uh, Catherine for her comments on this section as well as we get into step two. Thanks, now. Paul, and thanks so much um, to our speakers before. I will keep this super brief um, because I know time is against us today. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned, colleagues, about alignment um, to global strategies for organisations, whether that is a global organisation like FIP, but then regionally within our uh, WHO regions, and then, of course, nationally. Next click, please. 
we undertook then to create some regional roadmaps um, following the Astana Declaration. And last year, we were really delighted to be able to host uh, a regional conference in the Middle East, which was um, uh, in Amman in Jordan. And that was in April last year. And then another one in the European region in Ankara in Turkey, which was um, actually this week last year. And uh, we had more planned for this year, but as we all know, uh, COVID has put a spanner in the works for face-to-face -face meetings. But the idea of these is that across our regions, we will sign up to commitments to deliver primary health care across the profession, incorporating all of the points that have been made whether that be curriculum design. Um, and actually, Justin, I wanted to mention last week we launched a, a report of our uh, African region, uh, real innovations undertaken in a partnership with UNESCO in a Unitwin project. Um, and also what a small world it is. We have a Commonwealth Pharmacist Association. So next slide, please. We signed a memorandum of understanding which really strengthened the work on workforce, patient safety and primary health care last year with WHO. And that means we now can mobilise some of their plans and strategies in regions which uh, may need some support to develop primary health care strategies. But also where we can pair up member organisations that we have who have skills and strengths in certain areas to members who don't. Next slide, please. We've also aligned our work streams to the Sustainable Development Goals so that policymakers such as the United Nations and WHO know that pharmacy are contributing to these. Next slide, please. And we launched on the 21st of September, which was the start of World Pharmacy Week, uh, which culminated, as you've said, in World Pharmacist Day on the 25th of September, which is the 10th, uh, a decade worth of um, World Pharmacist Days undertaken by FIP. We can have no pharmaceutical care without a pharmaceutical workforce, and we have no pharmaceutical care without the scientific foundation for the next decade. So we launched on that day uh, the FIP development goals, which kind of unite us in a vision for the decade ahead. Next slide, please. We launched them on the 21st. They set the priorities to transform global pharmacy workforce practice and science for the next decade. And you can imagine colleagues that by having a roadmap across each region and within each country really helps us identify what goals we will achieve in the next 10 years and then how FIP can support that. Next slide, please. I think there is a short video. I don't know whether we will have time for that. It's a couple of minutes. Yeah, I think it's a good short video to Colleagues, as we seek to define strategies for overcoming some of the challenges we've identified, you can see that some of those goals really help us to bundle up our initiatives in, um, in delivering those goals. So let's, we'll revisit those at the end of the presentation. 
over to you, Rupert, to introduce the next speaker. Uh, thank you, Catherine and Paul. The next speaker, now the session is on solutions and evolving roles. Let me introduce to you Mr. Dawood Imsasi, who is the Director of, of, for Pharmaceutical Services, uh, or the Government Chief Pharmacist, Minister of Health, Community Development, Gender, Elderly and Children in Tanzania. As Tanzania's Chief Pharmacist, Mr. Msasi is responsible for ensuring the provision of quality and equitably accessible pharmaceutical services at all levels of healthcare delivery in the country. Mr. Msasi holds a Bachelor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Da and an MBA in Human Resource Management from St. Augustine University of Tanzania. Over to you, Daudi. We are really running extremely behind time. Okay. I'll try to go first. Uh, thank you, Ropa. Thank for you. The and next slide. Uh, these are just an introduction. Yeah, these are some of the tools that we are doing as a unit that is vested on my, my, my desk to ensure that we provide the technical support, the coordination, formulation of the uh, policies. We do the forecasting and the quantification for the health communities across the country. Please, next. Also, we promote the pharmaceutical sector in terms of manufacturing, as the other speakers have said, I heard it from uh, Uganda, from Ghana. Also, we oversee the logistic system within the country. We coordinate the operational research, you, lo looking at the, how the medicine are being used in the country. And also, we are also involved in the control and monitoring of the prices of the essential medicine. Please, next. Actually, we are guided with uh, uh, three documents currently. The first one, the policy. We have the policy of 2007, of which currently we are reviewing it uh, on some of the uh, uh, topic you will see. We are being mentioned what we are doing. And uh, also, we are guided by the uh, Health Sector Strategic Plan 4, of which uh, currently is on the review, yet it mentioned about the medicine and uh, Within the, uh, the, the pharmaceutical sector, we have the National Pharmaceutical Action Plan, of which now it's guiding us what we should be doing to ensure that we achieve uh, the availability of health commodity to those who are in need. Next. Uh, these are the eight thematic areas of the National Pharmaceutical Action Plan. And actually these are the areas of which again, it defines the areas where the pharmacists are working. You'll find us in the regulatory environment. Uh, and actually, in, in, the, in Tanzania, it's most, most of the activities have been invested to the TMDA. That is the Tanzania Medicine and Medical Devices Authority. You'll find us in the governance. Uh, we are working here in the in a government uh, governance, of which actually you see the pharmaceutical sector. We are here setting up the policies and everything. Also on the supply chain at the national level, uh, uh, that's involved the medical store department. We have the information system within, there are so many who are working with the supply chain, uh, devising some of the mechanical measures to solve the problems. We have the local, this the ground, not from the national, now we are talking of the local government. There's uh, so many people, the pharmacy working in the supply chain, in human resource, in selection and use, financing and places, those are the areas of which the National Pharmaceutical Action Plan is trying to define and see what are the role that we are playing to achieve the goals of having the commodity to the people. Next. Yes, uh, based on the challenges of which actually they have been mentioned, some of them from the previous speakers, uh, we have our own challenges that actually was facing uh, most of the areas involving the supply chain. So we did the review in 2017, uh, actually from the National Pharmaceutical Action Plan, we focused on the supply chain and then we came out with some of the recommendation of which we are working currently. I'm going to, I'm going to, to pass through them so that you know what are we doing to address some of the issues that actually we are facing to ensure that we, we, we deliver the common to those who are in need. Next. From our review, we, we did find that actually we need to redesign again the system that we are using to deliver the common to the facility. Uh, actually, we used to deliver common to the facility across the country at least three times, uh, four times a year. And uh, we used to receive the reporting from those facilities at least uh, four times a year. So like in quarterly basis, we get, we deliver and then we get the report. 
uh, that was uh, that shown a lot of inefficiencies. We wanted to transform it, so we we redesigned our system, and now we are we are getting the report on a monthly basis, and we are looking again to improve the data. Uh, actually, data has been mentioned as one of the challenges. So we hope by getting the information on a monthly basis, we can be in a position to intervene and uh, keep on improving the data because. It's an area very key in the supply chain. So you'll find the word impact. This is the slogan that we are using. Actually, we are geared to improve the uh, data and then to use them in decision making. And uh, we heard some of the speakers mention about the issue related to the stock out or sometimes the expiry. We found that most of the quantification or the focus that we are doing is a top down whereby we are using the, 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 the numbers, like the population we have, the mobility that they are trending. We find actually it's costing us a lot because we cannot know who is responsible for whatever that is happening or just remain as a remnant in the supply chain. So we went up to, uh, to develop something that we call as a bottom up quantification. We are one now to ensure that all the facilities in charge and those who are those at the facilities can do the quantification and lays up their needs up to the national level so that we can buy for them. The aim is to increase the ownership of whatever that is happening in the supply chain, to increase the accountability along the way so that whoever that has done mistake can be accountable for, we want to fix some of the problems that we have been facing for a number of years and actually want them to be very cost conscious as we know uh, the quantification and the uh, commodity and the forecasting goes with a lot of number, the, a lot of money uh, behind it. Next. And uh, uh, we, we, we actually, uh, people could, uh, some, I heard some of the speakers talking about alignment on the partners, the people who are involved in the supply chain people who are involved in the pharmaceutical area. So we used to have a different reporting forum and uh, the key performance indicator that we used to report was quite different from one person to another. You cannot gauge the supply chain, you cannot gauge the, the performance of the supply chain in the country. So we decided to develop the key performance indicator of which all the supply chain key uh, stakeholders, including the uh, implementing partners, donor partners can be able to tell and gauge uh, the performance in that area. So all, all what we did, we developed the key performance and then we, we, we launched it for everyone to use and current we are in line, everyone is working that one. So it's easy to, to improve whatever we feel that there's a difference, there's a challenge in reporting people can come out with the solution and decide together because we're using the same measure in measuring the, the performance. And uh, we heard of the rational use of health commodities uh, as an area of which actually we are focusing. You, you, you realize the antimicrobial resistance that is on growing. So we have a lot of issues that we are working uh, in that area. There are so many interventions uh, we have developed of which we're working in the country to ensure that we, 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 we sort it out. Uh, we even use the STG standard treatment guideline and MNIT, of which we are reviewing every three years. So it's another area of which we are focusing and enforcing to ensure that people are aligning with it to ensure to in, in service provision and uh, prescription and medicine issue to the patients. Uh, actually, we, we, we went with a lot of uh, a lot of issues and the problems in the laboratory area whereby there are so many expired and actually everyone was coming with its own machine uh, giving as a donation, but finally we are ending up uh, seeking the supply from, uh, from those who have donated and it was very uh, challenging area. So we decided to come up with the standardized list of equipment of which we over, everyone we should align to it and then we can be able to supply the reagent and whatever that is needed. And uh, you know the Medicine and Therapeutic Committee are uh, functional in the country and uh, we are reviewing it, but we are pushing to ensure that whatever that they want to use at the facility or at the hospital level has to be uh, to bear an approval from this committee of which actually the chief pharma, the pharmacist in that facility, the secretary and the in charge of the facility, the chairperson. So it's an area where you are trying to improve the utilization of medicine. And uh, we are specializing, actually, I heard it from Ghana, I heard it from Uganda. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are now building up the specialization in the pharma scada. So uh, if you, you, we are now 
trying to come out the clinical pharmacists will be working in the working in, in the hospital free, uh, area with the doctors to ensure that they 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 monitor the use of those health commodities they can be in a position to advise to see how do they uh, help those uh, who are prescribing to, to to align with the rational use of the health commodities and uh, the industrial part is also not left out uh, we, 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 we are very strong working in that area. We managed to come out with the manual guideline of which it's now pulling up the investor. Uh, we, we, we are happy to inform uh, the, the, the audience that we have actually 18 new uh, pharmaceutical industries are being built up. And the challenge in this area of which actually we are trying to address now with the uh, human resource from the pharmaceutical field. We don't have that enough number of the pharmaceutical who are specialized in the pharmaceutical industry. Though we have the R&D, we have one of the college in Moshi, which is giving up the uh, GM, GMP trainings and everything, but yet it's not an area of which we are very, very competent. So we are still building it up. And uh, our aim is to ensure that by 2030, we cut up the importation of pharmaceutical to below 50. Current, we are more than 80% we are importing. Next. Uh, another area I heard from the previous speakers a challenge is on the financing. Uh, you know, financing, the, it's a bit technical and very challenging across the African countries. We know that one. So we came out with the, some of the guidelines to ensure that we, we, we revolve the fund that we get and the facility can generate that funds. Also, we, 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 we capacitated the facility to ensure that they can manage the funds and we have been providing the system to support those management of funds at those facility level. The HR is also not left out. If you go in Tanzania and go on the, the, the data that they are being projected, in fact, we have a lot of challenges. Uh, we have not even met more than, uh, almost the, the, the human resource shortage, shortage is almost more than 40%. So it's an area which actually even the pharma sector has been affected. Uh, so we are still building it up to ensure how do we share uh, those uh, areas and how do we build up the people who can uh, handle the pharmaceutical areas in that in those facilities. Infrastructure is an area actually some of you have mentioned is it has been a challenge. Uh, we 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 embarked on uh, reviving the the health sector in the country, where there are so many new facilities have been built up. So we managed to uh, slaughter uh, within those structures, the pharmaceutical storage facilities. And uh, by also some of the places we managed to come out with the, uh, uh, as a department area where the separate building and the storage has been taken care of with. And uh, the other areas and the electronic information system, uh, we are moving out of paper. We want to be paperless. So far we have managed for all level from the health center to the national hospital, we don't use papers. We are in electronic mode. So we are moving. So we are still fighting to the primary facility to ensure that we move out of that. The aim is to have the information on time and actually to improve the data uh, for decision making. Uh, next. Uh, there was so many. Uh, and clear demarcation on the laws and responsibility across the supply chain. We developed the book that we call the laws and responsibility uh, guide and supply chain, just to provide the clear lines of responsibility and to ensure that the decision making is being uh, easier uh, than it was before. And uh, we came out with the impact approach. This is another innovation that we are running in the country. Uh, impact means uh, information, mobilized for performance uh, analysis and the continuous transformation. So it's, it's a slogan of which actually working. The aim is to ensure that we have uh, data that are improved and then we can use data to make decision. And uh, we, we, are not, we, we are not out of COVID. We are with the COVID again. We, we are faced with the COVID, uh, but yet we managed to come out the uh, guideline that was guiding us in uh, moving uh, the products from one facility to another or from national level to the facility using the data that was developed. And uh, uh, as everyone has said, digitalization is an area of which actually we are working to ensure that we improve the data visibility, we ensure that there's inter interoperability within the system and we go paperless. Asanten. Thank you. 
uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Laudi. Sorry for the speed. With, without, um, uh, I have sought the graciousness of Joseph, who said that uh, I will not need to uh, introduce him fully. Suffice to say, he's the regional manager for Middle East and North Africa from the Global Fund. Uh, so over to you, Joseph, from the donor perspective, rather a funding mechanism perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rupa and I, everyone. So glad to see all of you. I hope you can hear me very well. Uh, in 2019, the Global Fund supported activities are estimated to have saved over 6 million lives. Since the beginning of the Global Fund in 2002, it's estimated that the Global Fund and partners have contributed to saving over 38 million lives. Now I start with those numbers, if you go to the next slide, to show you that I am pretty convinced that those numbers are as a result of the work that has been done both at the Secretariat of the Global Fund in terms of pharmaceutical support, but also the work that pharmacists do across over the 100 countries that we support uh, through central medical stores in Tanzania, as my colleague has just spoken, as my friend and uh, uh, sister Nevin just talked about in Uganda, where the Global Fund supports the procurement of medicines for HIV, TB, and malaria. So clearly, th this is extremely important because pharmacists have played a role in transforming global health and will continue to do so given the challenges that we have experienced. And if we go to the next slide, uh, which shows the areas in which pharmacists can be engaged in. I present these specifically from the perspective of the Global Fund where we have support that we provide in strengthening management capacity, procurement systems and uh, policies, quality assurance and control. But primarily because of the, 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 the extreme uh, uh, important work that, uh, that is done at the country level. So at the Global Fund, we provide funding, but the actual work of, 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 of the difference that is made in the lives of the people who are affected by one of the three diseases plus other diseases is actually what happens at the country level. And therefore, uh, re-emphasizing the, 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 the role that pharmacists have in transforming global health and making sure that we have a better world uh, than we had. If you look at the, 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 the timeline that Paul showed, showing the increase in life expectancy that has been majorly as a result of improvements in healthcare of which pharmacies have been and will continue to be an integral role. If we look at my next slide, where I have uh, actually said, oops, in French, I think COVID has actually proven that this is going to be uh, 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 even more important that pharmacists continue playing this role. Now, I speak about COVID, but there are many other things that probably will crop up. Antimicrobial resistance is on the rise, uh, Ebola, Zika, and all these diseases will require interventions in which pharmacists will continue playing a critical role. At the Global Fund, we have close to about 30 pharmacists that are employed within a, a staff component of about 700 people, which uh, 15 years ago when I started, I was the only pharmacist there after Paul Lalvani had left. And uh, I stayed on as the first pharmacist, uh, the only pharmacist plus a medical doctor. To date, we are speaking about close to 30 pharmacists employed. So you can clearly see uh, the opportunities that are available and through which pharmacists can continue playing that role in transforming global health. And if you look at my background, that's not where I am, that's a bridge showing that through the trainings uh, that you have achieved as pharmacists, through the trainings that are offered by institutions like Empower, uh, through uh, the continuous professional development courses that are run by FIP, this is a bridge for you to move on from where you are to whatever you want to be and contributing to transforming global health across the world. So that's the message that I had to share with you. And I wish to thank you very much for, for, for being part of this, uh, uh, this movement and hopefully we can push forward 
and continue making a difference in the lives of the people who are affected by any of the diseases. From the Global Fund, we speak of the three, HIV, TB, and malaria, but I'm sure that in your community pharmacies, your ministries of health, you deal with a mild of other illnesses where pharmacy definitely through provision of healthcare, through provision of information, through provision of medicines, continues to play a critical and vital role. So thank you very much and all the very best uh, in your journey uh, towards uh, transforming the world for the better. Thank you. Over to Europa. Thank you, Joseph, for that short presentation, keeping to your time. The next uh, presenter is Steve. Thank you, Ropa. Um, could you move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, and a greetings from a, what is a very wet and windy UK, and it's perhaps appropriate that the theme of my presentation is sailing through rough seas. And certainly we are working in very challenging times and our world is one of permanent rough seas and white water at the moment, which is providing great challenge to us, but I think equally it provides great opportunity for our pharmacy profession to add immense value. Let me tell you very briefly about my career voyage and journey. Next slide, please. I, I'm a pharmacist and a graduate of Manchester University and my early years were spent working in the hospital service as a specialist surgical pharmacist and later in medicines information. I then decided to change course and after a few years joined community pharmacy and I loved the patient contact that that provided but my passion was education and development so I changed course again and set up our first and later award-winning training department and became a, a specialist HR director in the process. Later on, I had a brief period leading our internal communications function before returning to clinical leadership where I have been for the last 11 years. And my current role involves me overseeing clinical standards in pharmacy, in clinical nursing, but also online medicine, which is rapidly growing in the UK. Next slide, please. So in consideration of the challenges presented by COVID-19, we have both headwinds to overcome and tailwinds to make the most of. And some of those are shown on the slide and they've been mentioned by, by many of our speakers, so I won't go through them again. But what I will say, and I think it's come through very loud and very strongly in the presentations, is this is a great profession. Pharmacists have a unique role to play and have a real enthusiasm, I think, for role expansion. They want to do more and believe that they can do more. Our broad scientific base and skill set has certainly allowed me and many of the speakers that you've heard from today to move to new and different roles, challenging roles, where we've all had to draw upon our experience and our expertise, but also to have had the courage to take a risk to navigate through sometimes rough seas and challenging waters. We've heard today of common challenges, health systems under pressure, antimicrobial resistance, clinical capacity, and the need to use and embrace technology. But there are also great opportunities for pharmacists with their deep expertise in medicines and their accessibility and their desire to add more value. And here's that word again, to collaborate with colleagues in other disciplines. COVID-19, I think, has provided us with the opportunity to shine, and certainly in the UK, people are talking about this has been community pharmacy's finest hour. Because we have remained open, we have remained accessible, and we have been there to help people when others have closed their doors. We are in the position where we really need to capitalize, I think, on the gains that we've made, um, we have populations who are living longer, living longer with multiple comorbidities, needing more and more medicines and at greater risk, I think, as Catherine said, from some of the serious consequences of COVID-19. We should also note, I think, that here in the UK and, and I'm sure elsewhere as well, um, the public is switching um, very quickly, very quickly pivoting towards digital medicine. And there is no going back from that. And to give you an example of that, we have an online pharmacy. It took five years 
to build the patient numbers up to 100,000. That was in January of this year. It took 12 weeks from January for that to double to 200,000. And then it took a further five weeks for that to go to 300,000. There is no going back. And so we will have to embrace new ways of working, different ways of working, and new ways of interacting as we are doing today. Next slide, please. So we do need to be bold. We need to embrace change and new technology and not be fearful of it. We need to be where patients need us to be. We have to step outside of our dispensaries and be at the front, visible and accessible, not at the back, invisible and out of sight. And I will finish um, in timely way, I hope, um, with a quote um, from the American physician Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Um, which says, I find the great thing in this world is not so much where we stand as in what direction we are moving. We must sometimes sail with the wind and sometimes against it, but we must sail. And pharmacy is no different. We have to set a course and we have to sail. We cannot lie at anchor. We have to move forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the perspective from the private sector. Now we go uh, ahead with the next part, which is part three, practical solutions and the way forward. Over to you, Paul and Catherine. Thank you very much, Ropa, and thank you very much, speakers. Really, really excellent, really exciting um, session. Um, just to highlight a couple of key points that were mentioned. Um, uh, as Joseph talked about movement, uh, he referred to this as a movement, movement to transform uh, the pharmacy profession. And I like that. Um, it's just, it's not about um, uh, planning and thinking and goals. It's actually a real movement. And uh, picking up on, on the latest quote that was presented, obviously um, we know someone has a passion for sailing. Um, all the metaphors, all the, the visuals were, were linked to that and very nicely done. And the idea is to keep moving indeed. Um, the, uh, the focus on digital really important as well. And what was fantastic is to hear from a range of um, the six different uh, pharmacists who range from uh, working at ministries of health, global fund uh, and a donor organization, private sector, uh, civil society organizations, academia, and um, no one, um, uh, we, we have Johnson & Johnson, but uh, also uh, manufacturing came up several times in terms of uh, building and creating um, uh, capacity uh, for local manufacturing as well. So with that, um, let me go on to the next slide, please. So if we um, just click again, I think there should be uh, more data, more information there. Okay, just keep clicking, I don't know why it's animated, just bring all those out, okay. So the core competence, go back please. Uh, the core competencies of the global pharmacist. Um, so we talk about public health, supply of medicines, rational use, organizational and management skills, personal skills, and professional practice. And, and we heard about leadership, 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 change management. And um, we heard from Robert at j, &J that they're working with Gabby on, on the, the STEP leadership program. We're also part of that same initiative to work across Anglophone Africa in building uh, leadership and management capacity and vaccine supply chain. Uh, technology, um, digitization, we heard it from the public sector, from the private sector. And uh, the, the plan then is how do we bring appropriate um, useful, accessible technology across from the center all the way down to the last mile of, um, to the primary healthcare centers and the community itself. Supply chain, global to local. Um, the COVID crisis not only decimated the existing supply chains, but also the supply chain um, and the competition that it created for the PPE products. Um, uh, or countries basically paying top top prices to get their products um, and bidding out the other one. Uh, supply chain completely broke down in many countries. Data analysis and design, monitoring and evaluation. Again, it's data, data, data. And 
we as pharmacists aren't necessarily trained well to analyze and work with data, but it's something we need to be really good at. Um, real time and self-diagnosis, epidemiology and medicine. Um, you, normally one would think uh, we don't need to worry about this. Um, we are more on the side of medicines and delivery. Um, however, uh, the entire epidemiology is changing as I had shared in the earlier slides. Next. So um, I won't even try and pronounce the Latin version of it, but basically what it says is knowledge is power. And we have to keep inventing and reinventing ourselves. We need to grow. We need to add new skill sets. Um, I'll, I'll highlight the example of, of Neville um, uh, from, from Uganda. Uh, when I was speaking to her earlier, um, before um, she even started um, her master's and bachelor's, which she did in Cuba, she, had, she spent a year learning Spanish before she could um, get into the pharmacy, pharmacy school and program. I mean, I mean that's, we need to keep bringing that kind of excitement and learning. Um, other individuals have four or five degrees. Um, I spoke to some of you um, where you bring in, uh, you change careers significantly, going from private sector to public sector to academia and working in different areas and adding new capabilities. And that's what we need. We need to adapt, we need to transform. A lot of this information, knowledge, courses, um, certi uh, certified courses are available at no cost. Um, and you just have to make sure you find the right ones for what, uh, what your planned journey is. It's really the journey uh, that you're planning. Many of the participants were in their 30s and uh, 40s, in fact, less than 30. So in their 20s and 30s uh, were, were majority of you. Great time to start planning um, because as I had shown, showed earlier in the next nine years, next 10 years, the world will be entirely different and a bachelor's in pharmacy or a master's in pharmacy will not be enough. And that is a given. Next. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, what an inspirational set of uh, presentations today. Um, thanks so much, colleagues, for, for your insights. And I agree, quite, I quite agree, Steve, what a profession pharmacy is. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to come back to these goals um, because I think many of the things that we've heard today really align with these. And I look forward to working with many of you or signposting many of you to individual tools to support individuals in practice, very aligned to what Paul has just been outlining from Empower all the way through to help how to help your systems and your nations progress. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So we commit to supporting our members to implement the goals locally, regionally and globally. Um, and locally will also involve the individuals on the front line as well. And they include uh, products like our competency frameworks for your early stages of career, but also your advanced and specialist practice. And you can see an awful lot of the uh, areas of practice all our speakers have mentioned today involve how to support yourself in new ways of learning and developing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the way we, we plan to do this, and we're doing this right now, is setting up regional roadmaps across the six WHO regions where we have regional forums and then identifying through those regional roadmaps, the priority goals for the next year, year to three years. And they may change over time. You know, goodness me, we've all had to change this year, haven't we? Um, what we thought was going to be important at the beginning of the year may have shifted in focus uh, by the time we get to today, end of October. We're gonna be setting up indicators and country level metrics to be able to identify what services, what initiatives, what uh, deliverables are being undertaken today versus one year, three year, five years hence. And then also setting up transformation programs whereby members who have um, skills individually and as member organizations can be matched with those member organizations that have needs and wants. And that includes education provision like Paul has been uh, mentioning. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we want to work across the regions. We know that in different regions, these things will have different 
uh, priorities, but also within regions and countries, there will be a different focus on different elements here. Um, and the key thing here is that we want to make progress across all 21 goals globally, um, understanding that some become more in focus than others. And you might note here that we have um, some generic ones, which include um, impacts and results, which is uh, number 11. We have uh, medicines expertise, which is number 14. Those things are very relevant to um, the colleagues who've, who've mentioned them today. And you'll see here they're translated so that we hope to have a bigger reach globally um, and they're in a more useful and practical format. Next slide, please. We have an observatory where we've been collating data for about 12 years now, and um, many of our publications are built on that data, which would show the number of pharmacists or pharmacy workforce per country or the types of services and deliverables per country and being able to monitor that and track that over time or even being able for individuals to interact with an atlas where you can identify where you are in your practice versus another country similar to yours or where you want to be um, just to really kind of give us some impact and incentive to progress the observatory does and will provide a window on the trends of global pharmaceutical community, but the interactive atlas, I think, will bring um, a new found uh, way in which it will be relevant to you. Thank you. Next slide, please. We started transformation programs over the last couple of years, and these were initiated uh, initially with our colleagues in Indonesia and our colleagues in Jordan. And they have been around workforce where they, in the country, they've identified a need for transformation with their Ministry of Health. And then the Ministry of Health has gone to the pharmacy organization and has sought support globally. And this will be one model whereby we seek to transform and support transformation in country alongside the other that I mentioned, which is providing a platform for our member organizations to link with each other. Transformation takes place in very many ways and you have to be adaptable and able to incorporate all of them from accessing uh, developmental programs all the way through to accessing expertise to putting colleagues in touch with each other who have skills and knowledge in one area as where there may be a need in another. But if we're adaptable to this, then I think we really can demonstrate transformation. And we now have a roadmap ahead for the decade in front of us. And boy, will we need to um, stand shoulder to shoulder to deliver this transformation program. Next slide, please. And now I hand back to Rupert and Paul. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, now we are on the open discussion. Questions, answers. If there are any that the if if you we can still seek your indulgence because now we had requested for an extension of 20 minutes we have extended the 20 minutes so over to you paul are there any questions when i was reading in the chat box there were mainly comments i haven't right. seen comments right questions? Um, so um I, first of all my my sincere apologies to those who have had to wait in fact uh, i've got another meeting and i'm already seven minutes late for that one as well i guess it was um uh normally this was a 90 minute um session i thank everybody for their patience and also the speakers had some in, incredible and excellent rich uh topics to talk about so i mean i learned a great deal at the same time um, I would request um, Ropa and Catherine to uh, close out these discussions because I really do need to jump off and we do have a poll. The two things I want to mention is we have a closing poll, which is really useful. And also everyone can get their how everyone can get their certificates. Uh, my team will share that as well. Uh, everyone will get the presentation. We have all your email IDs. We'll share that as well. So, so don't worry about that. I know many people have asked for that as well. So again, one more, once more, thank you very much. And I do apologize that I have to jump off. Catherine and Ropa, may I ask you to bring this to a close with the panelists? Is that okay? Yes, uh, Paul, thank you oh. very much. It all the best. Uh, over to thank you, Catherine. You.
Oh, not at all, Rupa. I was actually going to do a neat pass over to you and say uh, as, what a wonderful chairing of the session. I agree with Paul. There's been far too much to cram in. We probably needed four or five hours actually to run through it. But I think we will need another another session at some time soon. So Rupa, I'll hand over to you to do the final closing remarks. But it's been an honour and a privilege to be here today and to listen to all the speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was my privilege and honor to be able to uh, steer this very informative uh, webinar. And uh, we still have one poll uh, and, and we'll be done. I see that there were questions around the certificate and I have noted that there are um, uh, directions that we are supposed then to take on so that you can be able to download the certificate. So Raul and Sonia, are we able to do the last poll?